Cool. Is this working? I think so, yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to be talking about a model of RNA, of an RNA repair system um, that we've built that is implicated in antibiotic tolerance, which is a precursor to the development of full antibiotic resistance. So, so I'm sure everyone's heard of AMR or antimicrobial resistance, um, which in 2019 caused just under 5 million deaths globally. And by 2050, that number is expected to over double to 10 million, which is obviously a huge problem. If we compare that to something that we all know about already, like COVID, since 2019, there's been 3.7 million deaths. So, like, it's a huge global issue that needs a lot of attention. So, yeah, we're studying antibiotic tolerance. So, we have a group of... A group of... So we have a group of bacterial cells, and some of them can be susceptible, and some of them can just randomly be tolerant. So tolerance can arise randomly. When you add an antibiotic, obviously the susceptible cells will die, and the tolerant cells will remain alive. So one thing about tolerance is that it's transient, meaning that the cells can flip between a tolerant state and a susceptible state. Um, Obviously, if they all flip to susceptible, then the antibiotic treatment will be successful. However, if we still remain with tolerant cells, the treatment won't be successful. And the longer these tolerant cells stay alive, then the more likely they are to acquire an actual genetic mutation, which makes them fully resistant. So tolerance is, yeah, it's reversible. It's a transient process, but resistance is an irreversible process. So once we've, we've reached this stage, it's, it's too late. So we want to learn more about this, this tolerance and why it occurs to hopefully stop the development of full-blown antibiotic resistance. So we're studying this system called the RTC system, which causes this kind of tolerance upon exposure to ribosome-targeting antibiotics. So on the left here, you can see a plot of fluorescence, which is representing growth and time down here. And we have the black line represents a non-inducing antibiotic. So when you introduce the antibiotic at time zero, the cells start to die, and they don't really rescue their growth because the RTC system hasn't been activated. However, in these three activating antibiotics, which are all um, targets of ribosomal RNA, we see that, especially in the uh, gentamicin and chloramphenicol, you see that the on antibiotic exposure, again, just like the non-inducing antibiotic, the cells die, but they're actually, after about four to six hours, they're able to rescue their growth. So that's like a key feature of this RTC-induced tolerance is that cells can rescue their growth after a period of antibiotic exposure. So what actually is the RTC system and why do we see this happen? So firstly, it's really highly conserved across all domains of life, so it's essential. Um, and it's an RNA repair system. So firstly, why repair RNAs? Like, they're quite transient molecules, especially like mRNAs. However, other RNAs are not, and they don't have such a high turnover rate, such as ribosomal RNAs and transfer RNAs. So it does actually make sense for the cell to repair an RNA rather than, rather than just make new ones. So the RTC system has two RNA repair proteins. There's an RTC-A, which is an RNA cyclase, and RTCB, which is an RNA ligase. So I'm going to go through the mechanisms of actions of these two proteins and then introduce that to the bigger picture of what we see um, with the system. So this is a, a bit of RNA with, it's a healthy bit of RNA with a phosphodiester bond making up the backbone. This RNA could be damaged and this bond could break. So now we're left with a, 
a fraction of RNA with a three prime phosphate um, end. So that's the substrate for the RTCA reaction, which, as it's a cyclase, it converts a three prime phosphate to a two prime, three prime cyclic phosphate. Now, this cyclic phosphate is the one of the substrates for the RTCB reaction. Um, so the RTCB protein is a ligase, and it basically ligates or joins together a cyclic phosphate end with a five prime hydroxy end of RNA. And that repair is always perfect and just reforms this uh, phosphodiester bond perfectly, and we then have another healthy bit of RNA. So that's the, the mechanisms of both RTCA and RTCB. If we think back to what I was saying before about how this system is um, activated in exposure to ribosome targeting antibiotics, we come up with a hypothesis that the damage to get from this perfect bit of RNA to um, the bond breaking is caused by ribosome targeting antibiotics. And secondly, that each bit, each one of these RNAs here represents a type of ribosome that we're, so the one with the phosphodiester bond that is perfect and healthy is uh, labeled as a healthy ribosome. And these are gonna make up the model, which you'll see in a second. So the one with the, um, the three prime phosphate is what we're calling a damaged ribosome and then the one with a um, the cyclic phosphate is what we've labeled as a tagged ribosome, and that will be clear as why we've called it, called it that in, in a little bit. So back to like RNA repair, if we think about this system like this and the fact that it's, we're now thinking of these RNAs as part of the bigger ribosome, it makes way more sense for a cell to repair a tiny portion of part of the ribosome than to make a, it's way more energy for the cell to make a whole new ribosome. So that's why um, we've hypothesized, hypothesized this um, in this way. So now talking about the expression of the RTC proteins. So RTC and B are co-expressed from a really tightly controlled uh, promoter and that because of this really tight regulation, it requires um, the regulator protein, which is the third protein in the RTC system, which is RTCR. So this protein is uh, constitutively expressed from just like a, a housekeeping um, operon. And so RTCR first requires its own activation to then initiate the transcription of the RTC A and B genes. So if we combine this operon here with the system of ribosomes that I just spoke about on the last slide, we come up with um, the RTC model, which so yeah, rep, uh, combines the RNA repair functions of RTC A and RTC B with the, the whole expression of these proteins as well. So what we end up with is as I said before, this tagged ribosome is called a tagged ribosome because it's recognized by RTCR and it's required for the activation of RTCR. Once RTCR is active, it can then activate the expression of the RTC B and A genes to the proteins. And then RTCA goes around and converts the damaged ribosome to a tagged ribosome and RTCB converts a tagged ribosome back to a healthy ribosome, which are used in translation of the proteins. So firstly, this model, um, we've constrained most of the parameters from the literature. Uh, there's three that are unknown, which are the damage rate here um, through ribosome targeting antibiotics, and then the maximal rates of transcription of both RTCR and RTCA and B. So by looking at this model, there's um, two that are worth noting at this stage. 
Firstly, there's a positive feedback loop uh, through the fact that RTCA is actually required for its own translation, essentially, because it produces the signal that activates its, uh, the transcription of its gene. Um, we have included some, there is some baseline expression, so we do have a very small amount of these proteins at the beginning, um, so, so it works. Um, and secondly, there's also ultrasensitivity, and that's included in the fact that RTCR, when it becomes active, is a hexamer. So we assume that it requires six of these RT, the tagged ribosomes, to bind to it for its activation, and therefore you get this, um, this shape curve that um, the more the bone block binding you get, then the more uh, the quicker the activation, essentially. So both the, the presence of positive feedback and the presence, presence of ultrasensitivity both indicate, or both kind of like a perfect storm for, or could indicate the presence of biostability in the system. So the next thing we did was a uh, stability analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah, very interesting. It's the first time I heard about the, the system. Um, how does it get started? Do you need, because, I mean, if something get, you have 100% healthy, you get one broken ribosome, how do you get the first tagged ribosome? Oh, yeah, we have, we do, we've included like a baseline expression of yeah. the RTCA okay. and B proteins. So you can get the first tag drive, so, yeah. Um, well, the tag drive, so, is the, like, kickstarter of the activation of the whole system. Sorry, I don't, I'm not quite following. Okay, so yeah, as I said, positive feedback and ultrasensitivity um, indicate that there could be bistability. So we did a stability analysis. Um, firstly, this isn't bistability, this is a monostable. This is what it would look like if it was monostable. So this is, um, these are steady state values and RTCB on the, left axis and um, healthy ribosomes on the right side. And as, as damage rate increases, the healthy ribosomes obviously decrease. They're being damaged. Um, and there's kind of a peak in the expression of the RTCB protein. And then once the healthy ribosomes and there's no longer enough of them to translate, then we also get a decrease in RTCB. However, it doesn't actually look like this because there is bistability present. So this is what it actually looks like. So as I said before, these are steady state values. And the gray the area represents a region where there's the coexistence of two stable cell states. So the dotted um, dashed line is an unstable steady state, and then we have the stable steady state that's on the, the upper region and the, the one that's on the lower region. So that means that we can have two, the presence of two subpopulations sort of at the same time. So if we look at the damage rate, and um, if we go from an area of low damage rate and we go up, then we'll be in the on state of the RTC system. So the system has been activated, and that's where we see the tolerance cells arising, if you think back to that first slide where the, the blue cells were tolerant. And then if we go from an area of high damage and we decrease the damage, then we will end up in the off state, and then those cells will be susceptible. So. It's depending upon the initial conditions of the system that determine whether we will be in the on state or the off state. And obviously to reduce the amount of tolerance and therefore resistance, we, we want to be in the off state. 
So the next thing we did was sensitivity analysis by perturbing the initial conditions in the model. So we perturbed the one at a time for each species initial condition. And what we found was that, in general, it's really hard to switch the system from on to off. Um, but it was RTCB that was the protein that was most likely to the, require the least amount of perturbation to switch the system off. So that's why here we've got RTCB steady state on the y-axis and then the damage rate again here, similar to the other plot. Um, the blue or green region represents when the system will be on, and then the red region here represents when it will be off. So if we, at a high damage rate or higher damage rate, we require much less of a perturbation to get the system to switch off. As we decrease that damage rate, the perturbation that's required to switch the system off is, is much larger. And actually, within this range of parameters and all the parameters that we've used here, below 1.5, we can't switch the system off by perturbing one single species. However, what this does tell us is that RTCB, by decreasing the amount that we have, that we are able to switch it off. So we introduced to the model um, RTCB inhibition. Just by assuming um, an inhibitor comes in, binds to the RTCB protein, when they're bound together, RTCB is now inactive and it cannot um, cause the, it cannot convert the tagged ribosomes back to healthy ribosomes. So when we introduce that and compared to uh, this bigger curve here, all the, every, everything else apart from the introduction of inhibition is exactly the same. So what we see is Firstly, the region of bistability becomes far less, and at the same time, as you increase RTC inhibition, not, well, obviously the, the amount of active protein decreases, but the region of bistability and the region where RTCB is, um, and the region where RTC is on is much, much smaller. So we're way more likely to be in the off state now. We've inhibited RTCB. If you think back to um, the, the model, the schematic of the model, when this was not my initial thought that would, I didn't think this would be how it worked. So here, um, I thought initially that if you, you'd have to inhibit R RTCA because that produces uh, the ligand that binds to cause the activation of these proteins. And so if you knocked out RTCA, then you wouldn't have any of the proteins and then the system wouldn't be activated. So as a comparison, um, I also did this exactly the same inhibition but with the RTCA protein. And what we see here is that, yes, the protein is decreased, so it probably is, the system is maybe less strongly on, but it doesn't really change the amount the region of bistability, and we're just as likely to be in the on state as we were before um, in comparison. So takeaway from here is that quite counterintuitively, it's the RTCB protein that you have to perturb um, and inhibit to cause the system to be off. So next we did uh, another sensitivity analysis, but instead of uh, looking at the initial conditions, we're now looking at the parameters in the model. So here we have, again, the RTCB steady state here and the damage rate on the x-axis. And in this plot here, I've changed the growth rate, which in the model is dilution at the moment. So there's two, uh, two values of dilution. One where in the purple region we do see a stability and then in the, the gray area, we, we don't, the gray line is not bistable within this range of damage. If we then um, introduce another parameter, so now we have the dilution on the y-axis and ATP on the x-axis. 
this purple region here represents, so for every combination of parameters within, that lies within this region, there is bistability present. We chose to, we perturbed both um, the dilution rate and ATP because although they're, at the moment they're fixed in the model, that's not necessarily very, very realistic. They're not always going to be a fixed number in, in reality. So if we then also change um, one of the parameters that controls RTC inducibility, um, we can see that this range of where bistability is present um, varies across a, a big range. So, as I just said, it's not necessarily realistic that the dilution rate and ATP will are constant values. They're, they likely do vary over time. Obviously, as bacteria grow, the growth rate changes. So, we took the growth rate from experimental data and we wanted to see what it would look like on this plot, the basically plotting growth rate against ATP, both varied over time. So, from experimental data of growth rate, we this model here of bacterial growth, which is coarse-grained model that takes into consideration um, key processes and looks at how they affect growth. And so we inferred the ATP values from the experimental growth rate, which gives us this black curve here. And what this shows us at the moment is that there's the purple regions, or the black line, the black curve intersects a number of the different purple regions, which kind of confirms that our assumptions of having a fixed ATP and a fixed growth rate in the RTC model aren't necessarily correct and that we probably benefit from varying these parameters over time um, to have a look at the system in a more dynamic way. So that is what we plan to do next. We'll, we're going to combine the RTC model with this model of bacterial growth. Um, that will allow us to analyze the system dynamically and also observe how, how RTC affects growth. Um, because it's like very linked to the, the ribosomes, we can connect them by the ribosomes and see how all the important cellular reactions affect the RTC system and, and vice versa. So, to conclude, um, I think RNA repair is a really interesting area that is maybe not being studied so much. Um, the RTCB is the protein that needs to be inhibited to block the RTC system and prevent the onset of RTC-induced tolerance. And finally, that it's important to consider this system um, within the dynamic physiology of the cell. So yeah, that's what we plan to do next. Um, thanks for listening and thank you to everyone at Edinburgh and especially Andrea um, for helping all of us. Questions? So we are not considering, I just introduced, so tolerance is like a precursor to full resistance. We've not modeled that transition. It's just, we're just modeling the fact, the system, and that we know that that system induces antibiotic tolerance. Tolerance just arises, uh, resistance just arises by the fact that tolerant cells are around for longer, so they're more likely to acquire a mutation. I don't think so. We haven't we haven't looked into it like that. Any more questions?
I, I promise to sit more in the front next time. So can you give us, can you speculate on the intuition why inhibiting RTCB works so much better than RTCA? Because you said it was counterintuitive, but must also mean you have some intuition now. Yeah, I, so yeah, if, originally I said, because I thought that if you inhibit RTCA, then you don't get any expression of the proteins. But I think the reason why inhibiting RTCB works so much better is because that actually produces the healthy ribosome. So with no RTCB, you can't go from a tagged ribosome to a healthy ribosome, and therefore you don't get translation of the proteins again. Yes, but then what I would see from the diagram is that now the tag ribosomes accumulate, which would even more activate this, this feedback loop, right? So it's still, you would say that these things accumulate and this would not shut it off. Well, if you would inhibit RTCA, you would not accumulate these tag ribosomes and then you would stop the feedback loop. So it's still very unintuitive, no? Yeah, but you still can't get expression of the proteins if you don't have any healthy ribosomes. Ah, yeah, that, that is true. <laughs> Um, this, this might be very wrong since I don't quite understand biology just yet. This ultra sensitivity, is there a way to tune that? And wouldn't that also just break down your feedback loop? Yeah, we're quite, we're not like super sure. And so we set the ultra sensitivity with some parameters um, and they would need, they were based on some assumptions. So they could be changed, but I think Still wouldn't get, you'd still get activation of it. It still wouldn't change the fact of the activation. So if there are not more questions, we can have a break now. And we have, I think, coffee on the terrace. Ah.